Al McGrath, we have Mike Nesbitt, Trevor Lunn and Martina Anderson and we have uh, Marie and Adrienne with us here. And also then on the phone we have um, Pat and Emma and Trevor. So we have no apologies but we might expect Christopher who's in the building to join us uh, at some point. And just as ever, we're being uh, recorded and broadcast as well, just to advise members of that. And if you need to use your mobile devices, just to try and keep them away from the uh, microphones in case that causes uh, any interruption. So if we move then to the agenda, we have no apologies uh, as item one. Item two, we have the draft minutes of the meeting, which was from the 22nd of April. They're on page five. Are members content that that's a true reflection of the proceedings? Content. Okay. So if that's the case, we can sign those off as being true. Okay. In terms of matters arising, there are no matters arising, which allows us then to... Or is any member any matters arising? Nope. Then we can move on to item four, which is the Brexit departmental oral evidence on Brexit issues. So there is page three of the table pack um, is a briefing paper, uh, which is also on pages 12 to 49 of the meeting pack. Um, we have hopefully present on the phone, I think I did hear Andrew McCormick. Are you there, Andrew? Yes, indeed, Chair. Thanks. Thank you. Good afternoon. And do you have with you uh, Lorraine Linus and Lindsay Moore? Yes, on the phone, Lorraine. Okay. Yes, Lindsay Moore as well. Okay, thank you very much indeed for uh, coming along via uh, phone today for this briefing. Just to let you know that it has been recorded by Hansard as well, and the transcript will be published on the committee webpage, just to make you aware of that. So um, maybe uh, would you like to, uh, Andrew, pass it over to yourself to give us a short update, and then we'll move on to members' questions. Thank you indeed. So... It's been a while since our last uh, session, uh, it was way back, way back on the 4th of March, uh, in what seems like uh, a different world. Um, but there were quite a few aspects where the committee had uh, requested some further information. So hopefully the paper has at least covered uh, some, if not all, if not all of those. I'm certainly happy to talk further about anything, anything arising from that as we go through the session this afternoon. Uh, just by way of update, uh, in terms of the position at... Uh, ministerial level here. Uh, the executive agreed to replace the Brexit subcommittee um, with an arrangement whereby certain specific meetings of the executive itself would have an agenda focus on uh, EU exit related matters. And the reason for that was because a subcommittee would not have decision making powers and therefore uh, when, they, when they would need to move uh, quickly to respond to issues as they'll arise and, and the, the, that'll become more pressing as the negotiations progress this year uh, that, that they didn't have to refer from the subcommittee to the full executive to get something formally authorised. So that, that's uh, purely a technicality in terms of, of, of why it's being done that way. Um, in fact, then, of course, uh, very soon after they, they adopted that approach, um, the uh, COVID-19 crisis hit and uh, we've had to um, really reprioritize very radically in terms of the way things are working. Uh, so quite a few of the team that I had working on EU exit matters uh, are redeployed into the work on uh, contingency planning and, and COVID. Uh, that's the same pattern across um, the other administrations in, in London, Edinburgh, Cardiff and Dublin. So it just, it just is, is the way it is. Uh, that's not to say at all that the work on Brexit is not progressing or unimportant. Uh, it absolutely is, and there's a quite a lot, quite a lot happening. Uh, I think more, more so in the last few weeks than, than maybe um, in March. Um, so, um, therefore, there are still things happening. Uh, for example, there was a, a full round of negotiations between the EU and the UK last week. Uh, that's been there were public comment on that from both sides. On Friday afternoon, and uh, we've had some some additional readout. So that that's all being done by by video link and so on. Uh, they've been there's been an exchange of draft legal texts uh, and time spent clarifying positions. I think last week was described to us as as a very full and detailed round of discussions, uh, and um, that's moved things on. Um, they are. Um, 
planning two further rounds of negotiations starting on the 11th of May and the 1st of June, respectively, and that's still providing then for the previously planned high-level stock take in June, which will take, take uh, an, over, an overview of the process uh, given the deadline of a, a formal decision on extension. Uh, that has to be taken before the end of June. Of course, the UK position is very, very clear on that, uh, both in in political statements and indeed in the withdrawal agreement legislation. Uh, the commitment is not to have an extension, and uh, that's that's clearly been made. We're, we've received um, some um, lobbying from a range of organisations uh, for uh, extension. Uh, we're aware that the, the case has been made by several at political level in in GB, um, and there, there, there's no doubt, as a matter of fact, that extension would be there would be complications around it. Um, the argument being made is that with so much economic difficulty arising from the virus, that um, the extra degree of change that 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 um, uh, economic Brexit, as it's been called as in the end of the transition period, would, would be very challenging. Uh, I think the, the, the truth is that any, any option would be, would be very challenging, and the UK position is very firmly against extension. So that's, that's very briefly where we are on the negotiations and the, the, the highest level picture. Uh, coming more closer to home and the issues around the um, Ireland-Northern Ireland protocol within the withdrawal agreement, uh, there was a meeting of the joint committee that oversees the implementation of the withdrawal agreement that took place by, by tele teleconference on the 30th of March, and Ministers Lyons and Kearney were participants in that meeting. Uh, there's a, a first meeting of an all specialised committee, which reports to the joint committee that happens tomorrow. Uh, so, so, so work on the... Um, implementation of the protocol, uh, the resolution of a number of issues that were remitted to the Joint Committee and hence onwards to officials in the Specialised Committee and so on, uh, that work is going on and will need to progress again given that um, on current working assumptions uh, we only have until the end of this calendar year to, to be ready. Uh, so that, that's uh, certainly taking up uh, a lot of time among those of us who are left still focused on the Brexit issue at the present time, uh, given the, the need, the, the, the un, un, uh, obvious need for so much political and official attention to be applied to the, uh, the COVID issue. Uh, it will be very important to continue to work across departments, and so we in the Executive Office and are, are still looking to coordinate and oversee the work across all the departments, uh, because the no aspect of the work is in isolation. The work on the protocol, the work on the negotiations with the EU and DFE's negotiations or their, their, their input to the UK's negotiations on trade deals with third countries across the, re the rest of the world, all of these things come together. There are aspects of domestic policy in relation to things like immigration. There's the provisions for in relation to North-South cooperation in the protocol. Every bit interacts, and therefore we have a, a, fair, a fair bit on in terms of holding these different strands together and making sure that, that uh, we have um, all the necessary advice and, and, and analysis uh, with ministers. But uh, the, the simple fact is that um, ministers' attention has been uh, very, very consumed totally correctly and understandably by the, uh, the work in the virus. So I hope that's maybe enough the way of general introduction uh, and happy to, to move on into uh, wherever you want the conversation to go. Okay. Chair. Okay, um, thank you very much, Andrew. So um, I, I'm no doubt that most members will be asking some questions and, and I'm going to start off and I think it's a, I, I feel the need to, to just to state that I think that the imposition of Brexit at this time is ludicrous uh, and I do think that it shows just that the, the depth that some within the Conservative Party will actually crawl to in order to achieve their ideological dreams. Um, I mean, coronavirus, as you have stated, is going to have such a massive economic, uh, and by extension, there will be social and societal 
detrimental impacts which are going to be felt by our constituents for a generation. And I think that very soon uh, after this virus passes that there will be much made of the hows and the whys about the response by Boris Johnson and his government after uh, and the way they implemented various elements uh, during the pandemic. And I don't think uh, that all are going to pass through that unscathed. But to add at this time of uncertainty, uh, the redoubling the uncertainty with including uh, Brexit is unfathomable. And that's regardless of whether you support it or don't. It's just the double whammy impact that there's going to be. Uh, and to think that Brexit can be negotiated with all of its intricacies and its changes. Uh, initially, to have done that within six months, I don't think was going to happen. But the fact that the, the virus has taken up uh, everybody's attention for a two to three month period in the middle of that, and we're sitting now within reality about eight weeks to the end of June when there has to be a call taken as to whether or not we can properly uh, uh, you know, implement the, the Brexit deal, I think is just ridiculous and it's going to be felt by a generation. But to get to the sort of the nuts and bolts, um, the, you, you mentioned about the replacement of the Brexit subcommittee uh, into the executive. Um, and there's just two elements to that that I would ask maybe for you to clarify. Number one is when was the, the announcement made that that was actually going to happen and, and how was that announcement relayed to committee and, and to MLAs? And as I understand that the dealings of the executive are um, effectively in private, they're in committee, uh, they're confidential. So how is the decision making that's taken uh, within that element of the executive, how is that able to be scrutinised and, and to be uh, checked? Um, so there's, there's uh, not, nothing uh, novel or unorthodox about, about those things. So um, the approach to executive business is, is uh, for Brexit as for, as for anything else. Uh, so um, the um, communication with uh, assembly both in plenary and in committee format would be a matter for ministers to, to decide in, in terms of how and when they would want to do that. I, I'll, I'm not sure if Lorraine or Lindsay have, 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 a, have a record or memory of any announcement of the change of format. I may, it may not have been announced, I'm not sure. Uh, no, Andrew, it's Lorraine here, I'll just come in on that. No, the, it wasn't announced. It was a, 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 there was actually, I, I think, a paper that went to the executive which agreed. So the committee met um, as a subcommittee for, uh, on the 4th, 11th, 20th, 26th, and then as the executive committee considering EU matters then on the 4th of March after that. So it, it was a, a process. I think it was an executive decision then to move to that executive committee considering EU matters. Okay. Yeah, the practical, practical reality is that, is that those things were, were just happening around the time when uh, everything changed very suddenly. Uh, it was probably the week of, what was it, 9th, the week commencing. Um, 9th, 10th of March, thereabouts, which was was when uh, the, the the virus issue was just beginning to really dominate. So um, I think that, that's just just my, my recollection of the timing of, of when these things happened, and, and that, that may have then meant that it was not what might have been conventional in terms of of either a, a, a written ministerial statement or or a letter to you uh, setting out what they're doing. I'm um, certainly happy to take that back and, and uh, see what ministers might want to do about that uh, and, and make sure that there's um, explanation and communication on these things. Okay, M maybe if you're doing that, Andrew, could you ask for an explanation as to why they took the decision to depart from the, the NDNA deal, which uh, all of the parties had signed up to, but it was all full parties that signed up to that. That includes the Assembly and all MLAs, but it was contained within it that there would be a separate subcommittee that would deal with the issue and just that if the executive in private decided to change the uh, NDNA uh, rules and not communicate that to the Assembly, that you know, maybe if we could get an explanation as to why they chose to do that. I'm happy, happy to take that back and see what more needs to be done and said. 
the what I would say for now is that the reason for the change was, as I said earlier, about the ability to, to for, for them as ministers collectively to take decisions and, and not have to re, have to re change format in order to take decisions. Uh, and the, um, the the decision to do that was taken at at, at um, with Sokunia and executive level when all five parties would have been uh, present and participating, and I, and I don't recall any any opposition to to the proposal. Uh, it was it was purely for practical reasons. So so n n and it doesn't take away from what the the spirit of the commitment in NDNA uh, th th to have separate meetings focused on Brexit. That that's that's still. Uh, still the commitment and still the, the, the way of working. It's just uh, instead of being described as a subcommittee, what was maybe not foreseen in the context of the work on NDNA was that a subcommittee technically can't actually make decisions. I, I, I understand what your, 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 your answer is, Andrew, but I suppose it would be nonetheless somebody could argue very practical that every decision is taken in a closed room and that it's never relayed to anybody but just enforced but we live in a democracy uh, we have an assembly we have a committee structure we have a plenary sessions and the idea is that the decisions that are taken by the executive have to be held and scrutinized by the committee structure so I, i'm not doubting the reasons, yeah. I, I'm not doubting the, the motivations, yeah. I'm not doubting the decisions. I'm just saying that as we live in a democracy, the, the reasonable thing to do is to present that to the Assembly so that it and its committees can scrutinise the decisions in the greatest part to support. But if we don't know what those decisions are because they're taken in private, it doesn't really leave for open and transparent government, which was, the, I suppose, the main thrust of the NDNA is that we would have a new democracy which would be open and transparent and I don't think it's that if five weeks in one of the key committees that was requested from it has decided to go back in the committee uh, which is discussions that take place in private uh, regardless of who's presented there I, I just think we need to think wider than that but if you could relay okay, those I'll thoughts back to, back to the ministers, no, that's, that's absolutely which fine. would be good because we haven't we'll seen them so it would be it would be good to get the message back to them. Can I ask them, you have as one of the uh, annexes uh, for the NI executive priorities in the negotiations, it says that part A is to represent, represent our position with strength. How are we managing that given that the two lead partners within the executive have diametrically opposed views on Brexit? Are, are, we, are they able within the um, secret meetings to reach um, agreement and and represent uh, Northern Ireland with strength. Uh, as you say, it's not. It's n there's no uh, nothing to hesitate about in saying that there are, of course, very different views across the executive, uh, not just between the two two main two largest parties, but across there's a spectrum of views. Um, what is is possible. And what has been happening, uh, consistent with that first principle, as in that annex, is that uh, all everyone wants as good an outcome as possible for the region. Uh, that's that's uh, not in doubt, and um, all ministers have been saying that there's a need to have, um, uh, you know, taking taking one of the most important points that there is the best possible facilitation. Of trade that exports from Northern Ireland to uh, to the main market across the water and into the EU, that those flow of the flow of exports is facilitated, and that there are the minimum possible frictions or barriers on the movement of goods uh, in the other direction. So all of that is is the if you like the outcomes, and this I think links to the theme and approach that is taken in the program for government. Uh, in terms of the outcomes that, that people want, uh, there's a lot of unity, a lot of coherence, um, because uh, the economic interest is, is transparent to have um, good facilitation of trade, maximum opportunity for exports, uh, access to trade deals, and so on. Lots of the things that were committed, again, in NDNA, uh, that were in um, 
rep representations that um, ministers have made to the UK government. Uh, that's been clear and consistent. So, yes, uh, all, all uh, coming from a background of very different views as to the actual policy intent and, and the nature of what's going on, uh, but uh, still seeking the best outcome for Northern Ireland. Okay. Um, the responses that you provided in, in the document that you gave to us were essentially answers to the questions that we as a committee had discussed at a point and forwarded into yourselves. One of the shortest answers in that paper is about the preparations for a no-deal scenario. It simply says that you're considering options. If it's got the shortest answer, does that mean that it's the area that has received the least attention? And given that we are about 68 weeks away from having to take some key decisions about whether we'll be facing a no deal or not, do you feel that the department and the executive is adequately preparing for that? Uh, there's, there, there's, there is more to be done on that. There's no, no doubt about that. Uh, I think um, we, we have to note, we note that uh, the uh, UK government ministers are expressing confidence that there will be a deal and uh, Chancellor of the Duchess of Lancaster referred on Monday in his session at the Parliamentary Committee to uh, deprioritising planning for a non-negotiated outcome. So that, that the, 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 we, there's no doubt that we need to be as prepared as possible and to do everything we possibly can to provide clarity and communication uh, to citizens, uh, to businesses, as to how to be ready. Um, but uh, the, there are, there's, still a, there's still a range of scenarios possible. Um, but confidence coming from London that there'll be a trade deal, and that, that uh, if there is a free trade deal between the UK and the EU, then uh, a lot of things become much more straightforward than they would be in a non-negotiated outcome. And the operation of the protocol uh, would be that bit more straightforward as well. For the point, of course, is that even if the rest of uh, if, if GB is is leaving uh, at the end of the transition period, if there isn't a negotiated outcome, again, contrary to what Michael Gove said on Monday, then um, our position is a, a bit clearer, you know, significantly clearer, in that the protocol would still be a, would, would be applying. So yes, I'm not, there's a, a there's a lot to be done. Um, there, there, it's it hasn't, in honesty, received this, the same degree of attention, partly because uh, the parameters are are pretty unclear just right now. So it's it's hard to do detailed preparation, and obviously these things would would arise at the end of December would be the point where where these things would need to be absolutely clear and in place. Um, so uh, yes. We, we do need to do more work on this, and we need to work with ministers on the range of scenarios that, that are still possible. Uh, the fundamental, the, the most important thing uh, to, to be clear about is exactly how the protocol is going to work. Before I move to, to the Vice Chair, to Mike, are those options for a no deal that you are considering? Is, is it possible to share those with the committee? Uh, we, we, uh, We'd need to see what ministers are prepared to do at this stage, and there isn't there isn't a vast amount of detailed uh, documentation on this at this time. Uh, as I say, that there's this is preparation for December. We we would need much more clarity from London on the planning assumptions they're making about how trade will work, um, and also especially uh, the the detail that that I know has been discussed at, at UK level on on the um, operation and implementation of the protocol. Are there options? Um, there are, sorry, it's more scenarios than options. Uh, the, the scenarios, the, the central case, if you like, would be uh, that the UK does secure uh, a comprehensive free trade agreement with the EU, and you, you're, we're then governed by that in relation to some aspects of the economy, notably services, and by the protocol in relation to the movement of goods. Uh, and so that would be one scenario. A second scenario would be where the, um, there is, in fact, no deal. Um, and only the protocol applies. Um, and um, that, that's where 
it, it's, I'm not sure there's I'm not sure there actually is a third scenario. It's probably one or other of those. Um, we w will know better. Um, the, the, June, the significance of June is the obligation in the withdrawal agreement for a, a final binding decision on whether or not to have an extension of the transition period. Uh, I'm setting that to one side on the basis that the UK has been so clear, uh, despite what you said uh, earlier, about its determination to um, persist with the, the position as in, as in UK law as we stand, that there would not be an extension, not be a request, a request for an extension, and that the UK would not support any request for extension coming from the other side. So um, th those are the scenarios. Um, y yes, much more detailed work needs to be done on, on all of them, um, but uh, we, 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 I don't think we've, we've anything directly to share at this stage. We're certainly happy to, to um, engage with ministers on that point. Okay, so we'll adjust the word options to scenarios in the report then, just to keep it clear for, for ourselves and for our understanding of that. Um, thank you. Mike, I'll pass to yourself. Chair, um, thank you. Could, just as a, a point of information, could I begin by saying not all the five parties of the current executive endorsed every aspect of the new decade, new approach deal. Uh, although, in fairness, I'm not aware of any of the five objecting to a, a subcommittee on, on EU exit. Andrew, uh, in terms of uh, open and transparent government, did I hear you correctly earlier? Did you say it would be for ministers to decide uh, on engagement with the Assembly and its committees? Um, if I said that, it was only, only in, insofar as that's their normal way of working, that, that it's, it's ministers who, who uh, make, make uh, statements to the Assembly, who uh, authorise... Uh, official attendance is that that's uh, nothing there's nothing uh, unusual or untoward about that that's just just the, the way things work and ministers are, are uh, politically accountable to the assembly does that not for example uh, disregard the fact that this committee has a statutory uh, power to compel ministers to appear um as you as you say it, 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 it is as you say uh, it, it's it's then for them to consider and, and decide what they say. Uh, that's that's um, that's all all a matter of political accountability, and, and I don't think I can um, enlighten. I, I have no no fresh or unusual enlightenment on that. It's it's it, it as, you, as as the the formal position is as you say. As somebody who has sat in this committee for many years now, I, I, I have a repeated theme of information flow in, in a full and timely manner, and, uh, and so I do tend to pick up uh, when I hear suggestions that could be interpreted uh, as, as a one-way street, whereas we're looking for a two-way flow, obviously. But let, let us move on. You, you said in your introduction that, that some local organisations have been lobbying for an extension. Which, which organisations? So a number of business organisations. I'd I, I, I rather not refer to, to a conversation that they might regard as private to the uh, to ministers. Uh, and uh, sorry, they, they may be. Uh, I'm just not sure as I speak whether they would be happy with me saying that to you. But some of them may have may have uh, written to either you as the committee or uh, other MLAs. Uh, I would, if, if, you, if you forgive me, I, I will I will say it's a number of the. Um, um, the business representatives. Okay. Would you assess that... Let me, let me see what I can find out. If, 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 I, if I can be fuller on that, yeah, 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 I'd yeah, gladly, gladly would be so. Yes, I'm, I'm perfectly happy that you're, you're discreet and, and protect potentially private conversations as perceived by the, the third parties. But in, in total, would you perceive that lobby to be significant? Um, I think that's a fair, fair comment, yes. Okay, thank you. Um, the Ireland Northern Ireland Protocol, you've said there's a lack of clarity. Over what? Over precisely how it will be applied. Uh, and um, the, uh, there's, there's a need to consider carefully uh, precisely what its obligations mean. Uh, so, well, at the highest level, um, there would be different presentations as to the understanding of what the protocol means 
uh, going between uh, UK government ministers and representatives of the European Commission. So that, that's uh, well above my pay grade in terms of, of uh, how things work. I observe that there are different things are said uh, between those, from those two different perspectives, and that's ultimately an unhelpful position, uh, nothing, nothing to do with me or officials here, but from the point of view of businesses planning how they're going to operate from the 1st of January onwards, you know, they need to know uh, exactly what the protocol means, uh, what its provisions relate to, uh, and the most uh, the two areas that are, are where further work is needed would be on um, movement of goods from here to GB, where in, in NDNA, the UK government promised to legislate to make sure there would be unfettered access for Northern Ireland goods in the GB market. Um, that's a promise made and which uh, has been re reinforced and, and should be delivered. Um, the, the other d direction of movement of goods is, is challenging because um, the position stated is that uh, the protocol would provide uh, assurance to um, the Commission and indeed to the member states that uh, uh, goods entering Northern Ireland uh, would um, be compatible with, with the single market. So that there, there's a major issue there as to what that means, how that is put into effect, and uh, our businesses need to know the, the right way to see that and the, and the way that that needs to work out in terms of obligations they might have to fulfil uh, within the position. But we're expecting uh, that that needs to be clarified in the weeks and months that are ahead as to exactly what that means and how it works, especially in relation to um, agri-food produce. You, you told us that the Joint Committee that met on the 30th of March agreed to six uh, subcommittees, including a specialist committee for, for Northern Ireland. Is it meeting tomorrow and will we yes. be represented? Yes, indeed. And who will represent us? I'll be there. Any and it's, a, it's a virtual, it's a virtual, like, like everything else these days, it's a, it's a tie conference, yes. A, a, any political representatives? The Specialised Committee is an official level. Okay. Uh, it's it's co-chaired by officials from Whitehall and the Commission. Okay. I mean, as, as the lead official in the, the civil service on, on these issues, Andrew, did you start the year with, with a plan, um, you know, timeline plan of, of action points towards uh, the, the withdrawal at the end of the year? Uh, we, we uh, with, with my team, both uh, the team based in Belfast and uh, colleagues in, in, in Brussels, uh, so Lindsay's on the line this afternoon from the Brussels office. Um, yes, we have uh, a, a clearer uh, view of how to move forward. Um, there are a lot of areas where uh, the formal responsibility for moving and taking things forward lies with the UK government in that international relations is and they, they, they are the signatories to the, uh, to the, to the treaty, uh, to the withdrawal agreement and um, so lots of the areas such as customs, VAT, tariffs, all those issues are not devolved. Uh, so, so a lot of our work uh, alongside colleagues, mainly in, in DFE and DERA, is on uh, understanding what is happening in London, Dublin and Brussels and being able to uh, encourage and, where we can, contribute to clarification of information for the economy, for the business community. Um, the most direct area of responsibility within the protocol would lie with DERA in relation to agri-food issues, and, and so we're working very closely with colleagues there uh, on all that's going on. Um, so, yes, uh, we, we have a, a good understanding of what we need to do. We're working in support of uh, the executive, first, in the, first with the Brexit subcommittee and more, more recently with the executive meeting in, in EU exit mode uh, to pr ensure that uh, the, this timely and you know, functional uh, advice to... Um, to ministers to move all these issues forward. Uh, t time is, is tight, uh, but 
uh, what, what is needed is uh, clarity from London on some of these issues to enable us to have a fuller and more effective action plan along the lines you're, you're suggesting there. Andrew, could I maybe just add to that, Lorraine, here, just to add about the governance structures around this? Yes, please. We did have a programme board um, before in the time when we didn't have the assembly in place, which was chaired by uh, Hawks. And one of the things that we have done since then is to review the governance structures in light of the return of the executive and how the governance structures work in that. So there is a formal structure still there in terms of uh, a program board and strands which run off of that and um, how we work across government and across departments. Yes. We have that structure there. So we have a trade and protocol board and some of the central functions such on the review of legislation and on the common framework still sits within TO. So there is a, still a, a lot of that uh, structure that was there is still there and we are still managing to get those good cross-departmental uh, relationships and the governance on that. When, when was the last time the executive met uh, in EU exit format? Um, the last such meeting was in, in early March as, as the uh, virus crisis was uh, unfolding. Uh, so it, it, it's just... I think everyone would understand that, that uh, the, the executive business, the rhythm of business has been so uh, continuous and intense on managing the crisis that that's just, that, that's just um, the way it's been. Uh, and uh, there's, it's, been, it's still been possible to keep um, some engagement going on, um, on Brexit issues, but it's, it's uh, necess necessarily has um, um, been less prominent, markedly less prominent than before. I, I understand the need for the, for the focus to be on, on the uh, COVID crisis, absolutely, Andrew. But given you're saying that uh, a lot of decisions need to come out of London, I mean, the fact there's been no monthly meeting of the Joint Ministerial Council uh, in European negotiation format since January uh, surely indicates slippage in terms of timelines. Um, so, uh, as you say, that, 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 that EN meeting was in Cardiff in, in January, and uh, our ministers and colleagues in, in Edinburgh and Cardiff have been pressing continually for further for engagement. But, uh, again, part of the fact is that um, the UK government has also been uh, consumed by uh, the, you know, the bandwidth for activity has been uh, dominated by the virus with, uh, for example, the... Um, the chair of JMC um, is the Chancellor of the Duchy of Lancaster, who has, has also had to um, uh, devote his time to, uh, to the virus crisis. So, so I think um, this is uh, a complex and, and, and very, very, very challenging situation uh, and important that we all do what we, what we possibly can to contribute positively to um, resolving and moving these issues on. Uh, and uh, there's certainly no, no lack of pressure from us at official level and indeed uh, in conversations and engagements at ministerial level pushing uh, UK government for clarity and, and resolution of, of the issues that matter to us. When we last spoke last month, Andrew, I expressed some surprise that the, the political policy was a full replacement of the spending power uh, post-Brexit. Uh, and I was surprised because I imagine many people who voted for Brexit did so because they were told when we repatriated our contributions to the EU, we would actually be better off <laughs> rather than maintain uh, the status quo. So my question is, are you aware of, of any political debate uh, within the executive uh, recently uh, about going beyond full replacement of spending power and actually delivering more money uh, now that the, the money is being repatriated from Brussels? Um, I think the, uh, the, the, the reality on, on that issue now is that spending plans uh, looking ahead will now be dominated by the consequences of the, of the, of, of, of the COVID, COVID issue. That's going to overtake um, what might have been available. Certainly, so I think uh, part of the point you're making there relates to holding, um, seeking from UK government funds 
um, replacement funding that would match what, what we as a region had been used to receiving from European sources. Uh, that, that's, that's one argument, and uh, you know, there's every reason to persist with that argument in the present time. I think uh, um, the uh, total balance of uh, supply and demand of expenditure uh, has changed so radically because of the virus that, that uh, you know, we're, we're at, a, at a ground zero in a sense. What can you tell us about uh, the Shared Prosperity Fund and, and how we are trying to shape it to our advantage? Um, I, I'm not sure I have any fresh information on Lester Rain or Lindsay have, can help me with that one. Um, or we can, get, we can get back to you with detail. It's, it's a DOF lead issue, as I understand it. But presumably at some point you will input? Yes. Okay. Well, can I bring yeah, Lindsay in? And, and are you in Brussels at the moment, Lindsay? I am indeed, yes. Okay, I hope you're staying safe. Um, Lindsay, are, um, I, I note in the, the briefing paper that decisions have not yet been made about the future of the office of uh, the Northern Ireland Executive in Brussels. Have you made a pitch? Uh, I don't think it's well, for officials to make pitches in, in that sense. I think we, what we do is advise on the pros and cons of options. Sorry, let me rephrase that. Have you presented a paper? We are actually um, undertaking, we had the, some a change management piece of work where we're looking at where we need to position the what role the office would have going forward yes. um, and what might be needed from that and to present options from that. We're doing that, um, gathering information from that at the moment, looking what um, our fellow devolved um, administrations are doing, what the UK is doing. Um, we've also been looking at what other countries outside of the EU, how they, where they feel they need to be represented with the EU institutions and where they interact with them and looking at those as examples. So we're, we're in the process of doing that work at the moment. Um, I think it's, it's, it is fair to say that obviously, I mean, as Andrew has set out, um, you know, there's a huge amount of work at the moment um, that the Brussels office has been engaged in, in um, tracking and reporting on what's happening um, and has been for the last few years through this whole process, um, what's happening with regards to the negotiations between the UK and the EU, um, and also um, in the last month or so, we've also been reporting back to departments on the um, initiatives that the EU has been taking in response to the COVID crisis as well. So we, we're actually mm -hmm. at this point in quite, um, you know, we're we're, about, we're in a, quite a intense period of work where there's um, a lot of different things happening um, at that point that um, are of interest to our colleagues in departments and are of interest to, to um, ministers. And just to point out, the Brussels office um, has a core part of the office, which is part of the executive office. But we also have people from other departments that are based in the office. And we work across all of the departments in the executive and all of the policy areas of importance to them. OK, thank you. Short final question and hopefully short answer. Andrew, when, when do you need to make the decisions on the future of the office? Oh, um, I don't think there's a, uh, an imminent pressing deadline for a, for a decision. Uh, the, um, that, that there's no, no particular driver for direct change at this point in time. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chair. You are, sir. Um, Martina. Um, thank you. Thank you, Chair, and, and thank you, Andrew, and others for, uh, for your contribution so far and for the briefing. And I have to say I was somewhat surprised when I just got to the page two of the briefing to read uh, the comment that at present there remains a lack of clarity around what implementation of the protocol will fully entail. And then further on, uh, on page six, it talks about specifically the interdependency between the protocol and the future relationship. And it goes on to say that this may become clearer um, at the end of the year. That's simply not true. And, you know, nobody should be trying to insult the intelligence of 
uh, people around this table and others, regardless of one's view on Brexit. It just simply is not the case. There is no lack of clarity uh, with regards to the protocol. There are 64 pages of black and white uh, agreement that, that has been made. A Google is all it takes, just a, a cursory glance um, at the document uh, would show what needs to be done in the, in the time ahead and the absolute necessity for the preparation uh, to be undertaken now. Because we know that because of Brexiteers, because of Brexit, whatever how one voted, there are implications um, for, for this island in terms of its relationship uh, with, with Britain and what will happen in the Irish Sea. So there needs to be customs officers. There's a need for veterinary officers. I'm conscious what you said about working with, uh, with DERA. Uh, we know that there needs to be an upgrade on testing and storage facilities. So at this very late stage, it may become alarming for people to know that these areas that work needed to be done as we potentially even go towards a cliff edge again, uh, given that it was difficult enough time frame to try to get a future relationship, absolute nonsense of an eight months, given the years it has taken the EU and other uh, countries to enter into some kind of a future relationship and they're only trying to do it with eight months before COVID and now we have COVID. Uh, so, you know, you can understand um, groups and organisations looking for an extension. extension. You know, I, I note what Mike said around the, the, the contribution. Sure, we all know now that was not true if people didn't know it at the time, because the contribution that's made from the north to the EU is 170 million, and it gets 500 million in return annually every year, not to mention every other opportunity that has come with it with regards to rights and entitlements that's going to be stripped away and lost uh, as a consequence of Brexit. So um, I just think that um, we, we need to be, be very clear with people that there, there was an opportunity that um, unfortunately was missed because the EU should be allowed to have, and it should have been allowed to have an, a, a technical office in Belfast. Uh, to allow their experts to, to advise on the suitability of any preparation or any work uh, that should be by now ongoing uh, and needs to take place at some stage just to ensure that there's checks and controls are compliant. Yet, as we, we sit here today, we know that uh, British ministers have refused that request from the EU not once but twice. And I would like to have Sinn Féin's very strong uh, rejection of that view from the British government that there shouldn't be uh, an EU office here because it's absolutely needed and it's necessary if the protocol is going to be taken forward in the spirit that it was signed off on. I suppose that's a lot of ifs it will be because we all know about commitments and how they haven't been honoured in the past by the British government and still not. So um, I think that... You know, we can't possibly do anything um, until, and this is what's been said in this document, until London finishes playing their negotiation fiasco game, as I would call it with the EU. If we were in that position, then that's what we have to wait for. That's nonsense. There's a protocol in Ireland. The withdrawal agreement's done, dusted, not going to be opened up again. We know what's in it. We know the implications of it. Whether one likes it or not, we know what's going to happen uh, here in the north with regards to the protocol, whatever about the future relationship. So we know what needs to be done. So we don't have to wait to the end of these negotiations. And I don't think we, we can be falling into that because we need to increase the checks and controls, unfortunately, um, because of the Brexiteers in the Irish Sea. And we know what the protocol says about all of that. And I note that in your response, you provided no real clarity um, what input you know, has been made in terms of the work of the Joint Committee 
and the Specialised Committee. I know, uh, although I do know that the two junior ministers took part in the in the last uh, joint joint committee, but I suppose our interest in the interest of the people um, in the north is about ensuring that that the protocol um, on Ireland is implemented uh, in full. You had mentioned that the British government's commitment to the new decade and new approach to the unfettered access. You know, that's up to the British government and they should be honouring that commitment that was made. But that's nothing to do with, that's not going to open up the protocol. The EU was very clear. That was up to the British government to make that agreement, to give that commitment to outline how there would be unfettered access. It wasn't going to imp impact on the, on the protocol. The issue that you dealt with on legislative consent, I think with regards to any legislative consent uh, that might be required, it needs to be clearly understood that it will not be Sinn Féin not going to consent to any lowering of, of social standards, of labour standards, of environmental standards or consumer protection um, in the North. And the, the common framework that's referred to, um, we've raised a concern um, also uh, because the, since this, this note has been complied, uh, we, we also have been, we have had information, um, or we need more information, I would say, on these, on, on what these frameworks are. You know, I don't see, just listening or reading the, the document, I don't see that we should be in a position whereby power over affairs in, in the north, you know, are returned to, to London uh, until, uh, or under these frameworks. So, we, if we could get some more, probably some more information on that. There's issues around the North-South engagement in the document and um, concern, to say the least, if not alarm, that you've noted that the Department of the Economy still needs to clarify, uh, clarify the role that the executive will have in the future relationship. My God, you know, my goodness, as we're sitting here today and maybe going over a cliff and we're, we're, we're finding out that that, uh, that that lack of clarity from the Department and uh, the Department of the Economy uh, hasn't yet been received. So there's loads of other, look, there's, there's, and people shouldn't be surprised in terms of the, the kind of questions that I'll be bringing to the table, given where I've come from and the work that we have been involved in with regards to Brexit. But uh, I may come back to you on, I'll just wait on some of your responses and come back to you maybe on some of it. Um, thanks, thanks for that. There's an awful lot uh, in what you said that is uh, it's just straightforwardly correct. Uh, I think what I would would, would uh, emphasise is that uh, there is a genuine and substantive interaction between the work on the protocol and the free trade agreement. Uh, and indeed, the protocol, uh, the withdrawal agreement itself. Um, makes provision for the protocol in certain circumstances to be superseded. Now, uh, you and I both know from all our discussions uh, in Brussels uh, that, that um, there is no question that uh, the EU or the member states would agree to something superseding the protocol that doesn't deliver the same functional outcome. Uh, and, and everyone, uh, including the UK government, have been very clear and very straightforward in relation to uh, the um, need not to cause any difficulty in relation to the land border. I mean, that, that, that's, that's why the protocol, protocol exists. And uh, all I'm saying is that the, the withdrawal agreement does provide for it in certain circumstances to be superseded. Uh, so therefore, there's a genuine, there is a genuine negotiation to be had in the course of this year um, on the actual implementation of the the bits that are, are you know, not not interacting, they, they, they could be mainly on issues to do with customs and tariffs and trade uh, in, in mainstream goods, where there be some effect. Uh, and and I'll, I'll come back to that in a moment. But uh, the um, other aspects, not not least as you say, in relation to um, SPS controls. Uh, you know, the the um, UK government has confirmed very clearly that uh, it accepts and will fulfil the obligations. The question is precisely how they be fulfilled, 
and whether there's, there's room uh, in discussion and by agreement with the EU to get to something which allows uh, precise detail of that to be worked out, as in how will these checks work, exactly where, the, where, where are they applied, exactly what proportion of various uh, commodities or aspects need to be looked at. So there is genuinely some very detailed and very important work to be done to get to uh, the best place we get we can, we can and the common ground uh, across ministerial level is to, is to ensure that, that the, there is as little friction as possible on the movement of goods. It has to fulfill the fundamental objective, which is, is precisely as you've said. Uh, that's, that's why the protocol exists. It has, to, it has to work functionally, but it also has to be effective and not um, do economic damage. So there's, there's, there are very, very big concerns in the business community, uh, in retail, in agri-food, that um, if you only look at the letter of the words, uh, the letter of the law, then we end up with some pretty serious issues to be dealt with. Um, and uh, the, the, for example, um, the obligation for uh, export health certificates on goods moving from GB to NI, that's, that's been raised with us by the business community as a serious concern. What may be possible in terms of an outco outcome on that is for discussion. Uh, the objective from across um, across the parties, as, as far as I'm aware, in, in the executive, is that is to is to get the best possible outcome. So there is some genuine lack of clarity that, that, the, that there is a need for that to be resolved, and that depends on further work between ourselves in London, and then uh, with the European Commission who will be acting, of course, as they always do, uh, on behalf of the member states who are uh, understandably very concerned. Uh, you know, you, you'll know from your previous contacts with, with uh, MEPs um, that, that there, there are, uh, this is an, an, an issue of genuine and legitimate interest across, uh, across the member states. So uh, a lot to be done on that. Um, the, the, there, there's a lot that is clear uh, but there's a lot that needs to be resolved in detail and genuine and detailed work to be done in moving all this forward to get um, the, the best possible outcome. So we'll go back to the fact that we do have a lot of consensus across um, the executive in terms of, of wh where we want this to land as in an acceptable and effective outcome. Well, Mr. Yeah. Lorraine or Lindsay, what that uh, would have said there. Uh, yes, yeah, so just maybe add on common frameworks. That was one of the very first um, impacts from the decision to leave the EU. Um, the number of framework areas has varied over the years as some have become consolidated. And um, it is a key part of the domestic policy on how these areas are going to be managed. The majority of them, or quite a few of them, do sit within the agriculture space such as nutritional labelling, FPS, um, and we do need to find a common way of working within the UK that allows that, um, that internal market to be able to function. Um, it is complicated by the protocol because obviously in those areas that I've highlighted, we will be aligning to EU rules and, and regulations, and that's one of the complicating factors of the, com of the Common Frameworks project at the minute. Um, but there has been considerable work. It, the numbers that actually require legislation have dropped considerably, and many of these are seen as being a mechanism of managing them across the UK in terms of dispute resolution um, or memorandum of understanding. So there, it is actually the Common Frameworks Project has been one of the areas where we really, across the four, um, England, Scotland, Wales, and the UK government have worked very positively together and um, moved quite well in terms of trying to find solutions to them. Um, can, can I say, just by way of comment uh, to yourself, Andrew, like it's, it's all very well trying to get the best possible outcome after being involved in creating untold damage um, for, for the business community and, and, and the sectors. And it's going to be a very difficult uh, journey that they're going to embark upon, whatever the future relationship uh, whether we go over a cliff and even if we don't, uh, there is no good Brexit. Um, the, it's not the common framework 
with all due respect, Lindsay, it's a problem. Brexit's a problem. Um, in terms, it's not the protocol that's a problem. And, um, and therefore, the, what we have at this moment in time around EU protections, uh, when I was in the Justice Committee, you know, looking at the implications for policing, for justice, uh, the common frameworks, what's the implications there of how all of those uh, will impact in the time ahead. It would be good, I think, if we had an overview. If you're saying now we don't have to legislate, what can we have a memorandum of understanding about and the implications of those, uh, Chair, if we could have um, a bit more information on that as, the, as we go forward. Um, in the document it says, in the, pa in the paper it says around the um, there was discussions with other default administrations, and you're saying they're all going now. Maybe it's just how I'm reading this, um, because like this protocol doesn't require consultation. The protocol's over, but I'm sure if, if at this late stage even some default uh, uh, regions need to know more about it, then uh, Google will help. But I'm sure having those engagements uh, um, can be helpful. But they're not something that's going to shouldn't be delaying. The, the need for putting the, the, the work in place and, have, and having the protections in place and the precautions and just having the preparation done. Because as we all know, the protocol was a special case that was made. It was a special status for here because of the unique circumstances that, that we live in, because of the all Ireland yeah. economy and the Good Friday Agreement, and to avoid any hardening of the border on the, on the island. So... You know, these are pretty serious issues that, that we're having mm -hmm. to deal with, and the clock is ticking. And we can't allow anybody to take us to just to run down the clock so that we are pushed over a cliff edge and we're, you know, we're struggling as it is here with COVID-19 and everything else. So the preparation work needs done. And whether it is unpalatable, particularly for Brexiteers, because they're not wanting to, and no one wanted this outcome. Uh, but there were consequences uh, for Brexit, and we need to try and mitigate the damage, but we also have to deal with reality. Withdrawal agreement's done, the protocol is there, and we need to move forward with implementing it. Yes. Hear and understand all of that, indeed, and, and uh, that's, that all, all of those points and are um, part of the uh, discussions that are happening and need to happen further, uh, both uh, at ministerial level here and in uh, in our interaction, uh, especially with London. Okay, thank you. We'll move then to Trevor Lunn. Okay, hello, Andrew. Can you hear me? Okay. Yes. Go ahead. Thanks. Yes. Um, well. well, okay, Mr. Lunn, if you like. Uh, you mentioned earlier on uh, unfettered access, and the, the, the way you phrased it, you made me think that perhaps the question of access between Northern Ireland and GB has been settled. Uh, is, is that what you meant? Well, the, the principle, uh, the, the commitment from the UK government is that, that uh, they will legislate to underpin the, the access of Northern Ireland goods to markets in GB. Uh, there's also commitment. Um, it, it's referred to in the protocol and also in, in NDNA to ensuring that uh, Northern Ireland exporters will be able to participate fully in future uh, UK trade deals with third countries in the rest of the world. So th those are, are clear commitments by UK government. Uh, I think they won't be fully settled unless and until the legislation has been brought forward and implemented. And you know, that's not happening very quickly, it, 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 given the, the preoccupations of, uh, uh, in, in London with COVID and so on. But uh, the very, very clear promise was that those provisions would be in effect by the end of the year, in other words, before the protocol comes into effect. And therefore, uh, strong and positive assurance on these points from the UK to um, uh, to us, uh, to our ministers, uh, that's been um, really very, very clear. So it's not it's not settled in that sense, but it's it's uh, uh, the, there's no doubt about the commitments. Yes, I can understand the 
uh, Northern Ireland Executive and the UK Government might be able to come to some agreement about this, but where, where does the EU stand in this? Because surely there is a clear difference of opinion between what so, unfettered uh, access... In addition to moving the goods from NITGB, um, the, the, most of the issues there are within the UK's discretion. Um, and uh, th 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 there is, as uh, was as was said by um, Secretary State Barclay back soon after the withdrawal agreement was published, that there is an international obligation, and there are, there are a range of there, there are probably some other detailed and specific international obligations, but there is a, a general one in relation to the uh, need for um, what are called exit declarations on goods leaving Northern Ireland uh, to go to GB. That that that's uh, a, a technical requirement, and it, it, it's it's there as a, as an as an existing obligation, um, but uh, it it need not uh, stand in the way of um, making sure of making sure that, that goods can actually get into the uh, into the in, into the GB market. Uh, that's that's there's nothing there's nothing much else that's a, an EU responsibility. Uh, the, the EU responsibilities are much more significant uh, in relation, and, and, as, as came out very clearly in the, in the conversation with Martina there, that there's a, a lot there that, that is, is necessary for the protocol to work properly and to fulfil uh, the basis of the agreement, which is um, to uh, allow, uh, allow things to work in the way intended. So that, that, that's, that's, there's much more EU locus on Moving to goods from GB to NI than on NI to GB. Okay. So the, the, we mentioned the concern of the business community there a while ago, and I mean you rightly wouldn't identify the, the organisations that are expressing concern and, and effectively pleading for an extension here. But we all know who they are, and they're probably the same ones who pleaded not to go for Brexit in the first place. So. It, this is now a stalling operation to try and get to get the best possible deal that they can before the inevitable happens. The, um, Sorry, a little bit, a little bit of vent, please. Can you? Is it possible to get any better sound? Speak up. Uh, I think you want me to speak up. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, I'll, I'll leave that one hanging. Is there anything you can say about about any more you can say effectively about time scale here? Because we're, we're now, I mean, the, the, the real deadline here surely is the 1st of May. That's, that's when the stock take has to begin, isn't it, to decide whether the government will ask for an extension. Now, the, the government is absolutely implacably opposed to an extension. It's not the first time they've been implacably opposed to something and had to give way. But I get the feeling this time that, that they probably mean it. So the, the, the time scale between the end of June and the beginning of uh, January or February is, and, and the changed circumstances that will apply uh, in, the, in the event of that we have refused an extension, it doesn't really bear thinking about. I mean, you look at look at what's happened to date, and I go back to the start of this conversation when the chair was asking you about the Brexit subcommittee and the change to uh, an executive uh, approach because the uh, subcommittee didn't have any decision-making powers. But the subcommittee would have surely reported to the executive with recommendations. That would be a far more natural way to do things. And given what's happened with uh, coronavirus and the attention and the diversion of attention by the executive towards that crisis, which is every bit as big as the one we're talking about, perhaps bigger, I can't help thinking that, that we, we would have done things in a different order or perhaps not done some of these things at all if we'd seen Brexit so clearly coming over the horizon. The, um, are you satisfied, and don't want to make this a political question, are you, are you satisfied that the Executive Committee approach, even if it's separate meetings, can possibly deal with all these issues in the level of detail that, that needs to be dealt with? This is, this is a, 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 it's a very challenging set of issues, but that, that's, what, uh, that's what it's all about in a way. Uh, and. Uh, it's up, up to us as officials to, to provide all the possible support and advice analysis to, to do the, uh, the, the, the detailed work on, on analysing issues and options and try and distill that into uh, 
issues where people who will come at it, as I said earlier, with very different political perspectives and aspirations, nevertheless, to, to see what the options would mean in terms of their effect uh, on the economy, on how society works. Uh, and so, so I, I think it's, it's um, no different from any other aspect of government work. It's difficult and challenging, but uh, this, is, this is what it's all about and, and what needs to be done. Uh, time is, uh, I think time is, as you say, short. Uh, in, in the, the high-level stock take between the EU and the UK is to take place in June. That's after the next two negotiating rounds, which are scheduled for the 11th of May and the 1st of June. So mid to late June, there's that high-level discussion, and that's the last opportunity within the terms of the withdrawal agreement for the possibility of extension to be settled in that context. Uh, as, as you said, and as I said earlier, there's, there's, there's a very clear position being taken by the UK. And uh, yes, there are very well articulated arguments from the business community about the detrimental effects of extension. I think it is also, it is also true that uh, if there was to be an extension, then that creates other uncertainties, and uh, it, there are certainly issues around the way in which they would, would affect fan, the financial position. Uh, so it's 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 not a black and white argument by any means. That there there is there there will be complications arising from extension. Um, I think the urgency the 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 urgency is to get to. Um, Precisely what implementation of the protocol means. Yes, there's lots of things that are very clear about it, but there, there's still detail to be worked out, and for there to be um, the best possible progress on the mainstream negotiations uh, on a, a, a free trade agreement and related side agreements between the UK and the EU. Uh, a lot of that is is in London's hands, but uh, the the responsibility on us as officials and, and then and, and advising ministers is, is about how do we make sure that our issues are explained clearly and, and, and fully to the UK government and uh, to the extent, to the best extent possible, taken into account in their decisions. It's, it's, uh, it, there's an, a lot of big challenges there, um, but we have to pursue and, and seek, uh, seek the best possible way forward. Okay, thanks for that. Uh, just one more quick one, uh, Chair. Um, just around fishing and fisheries and fishing rights. It, it's mentioned in the, the response you gave us, but only only a mention. And I heard uh, Mr. Barnier recently, frankly, blowing his top at the notion that we hadn't managed to settle the fisheries disputes or on upcoming disputes, and that the British position was absolutely untenable in terms of taking back control of its own waters and so on. Um, we know the argument. Is there any, and it's, it's not perhaps the biggest economic issue, but it's a huge issue for the fishing community here. Yes. And uh, is, is there any progress there that you can report or any any light at the end of the tunnel that would give some comfort to the people in Port of Ogier or Kilkeel? Um, I'm not sure if you're in can help me with that one, please. Um, well, fish, fisheries under under the negotiations is, is sits outside the free trade agreement, and I mean I think you could tell from the readouts of the negotiations from last week um, that there is very different positions on that, um, and I think that uh, there you know there are a number of areas where there is where is, there is a lot of divergence between the EU and the UK, um, which we just at this stage we can feed in our views on that, but that is something that needs to play through probably in, in the negotiations, but we are aware that it is it is a big issue. Okay, thanks very much. Okay, thank you. Um, what I intend to do, because we have no other method of doing this, is just when I called the members that were on the phone, that the order that they shouted in was uh, Emma and then Pat and then <coughs> Trevor. Now, I appreciate that may not have been the order that you joined the, the call in, but it's the only system I have at this stage to call you. So could I go first to Emma and ask you, do you have any questions you, you wish to ask? And Emma may not 
either. So we could go then to Pat and ask Pat if he has any questions. Uh, yes, Colin. I think most of the issues have been covered, but could I just ask how we are going to access uh, and participate in future EU-funded programmes such as Erasmus uh, and R&D and clinical trials and so on? Has any priority been given to that? Lorraine, can you help with that, please? Um, I could, I could maybe do it. Sorry, well, Lindsay, yes, go ahead. Lindsay, yeah, sorry, just to say that um, one of the very important things that you know we have been looking at is um, exactly um, how some of the the EU programmes will continue, what access the Northern Ireland might have to some of these programmes. Um, what we what we do know at the moment is that the two that you've mentioned, which is the Horizon, um, which is the Research Innovation Funding, and Erasmus, are both on the table being discussed as part of the negotiations at the moment between the UK and the EU, um, that they're looking at how the UK might continue to have um, access to those programmes and on what basis. And um, that's something that um, we've been quite clear um, you know, that we would wish to continue still to participate in those programmes. We know they're very important to our, particularly to our universities, because um, particularly the research funding, um, which supports a lot of collaboration. It's not just always about the funding, which is, of course, important, but it also requires you to be in partnership with um, other researchers across Europe, and that has been very important in bringing together experts in certain areas um, to put together um, uh, projects and bid for, for the funding. So we don't know what the outcome of that will be. That is currently under discussion, but it is definitely one where we've indicated that um, we would like to see that continue. Okay. Thank you. Um, Pat, have you any more points? Or you ha no, no, I, that's, uh, that's all I have. Thanks. Okay. Um, Trevor, if you're still there, Trevor Clark. No, I think we've, we've, we've lost Trevor there in, in the Just process of time. Just to that Emma is listening, and she said she found it easier to listen to you, look at us online and hear it. With us. Oh, right, okay. okay. But she says she's okay, she doesn't have a question, but she's oh, okay. she That's trying grand. to get in to tell you So that. We'll, we'll say hello to Emma in, in 30 <laughs> seconds' time there, yeah. Okay, um, there's just one or two smaller points, um, Andrew, that we've sort of got from... The, the, the top desk here in terms of um, on page 15 there's reference to the democratic consent uh, and the consultation regarding that and it says that it's not it's an issue regarding the, the UK government and therefore um, the assembly yeah. might want might want to write regarding that is the suggestion that the assembly might want to write uh, an indication that the executive doesn't intend to um. And I, that, that's not something that's that's, that's come up um, in yeah. recent discussions. So uh, let me let me take that away and see sure. what I can find out about that and come back Practice. to you. And also, you had mentioned as well about you attending um, the specialised committee tomorrow um, on behalf of the executive. Might you be able to give us an update, a written update on that meeting and what the outcomes of it maybe for next week? Um, that's it's a it's a it's a confidential meeting. Um, but uh, let me do, do do what I can according to also what um, um, what ministers would be content with me sharing. But I'll do my best on that. Yes, for you. Okay. And finally, um, there was reference earlier to the existing EU funding programme and that the the new um, shared prosperity fund that would then replace it. Is there currently a list of all funded projects and all jobs that are? Uh, currently in existence as a result of EU funding. Do you have that like as a centralised list that we can say this is what needs to be replaced in the future, notwithstanding that there was the uh, more than a hint that it would be increased or enhanced, but is there at least a status quo there that we know is in existence at the minute that then could be compared to what, what there will be uh, this time next year or the year after? Um, Andrew, do you want me to answer? Just please, yes. Yeah, just to come in on that, I think on the Shared Prosperity Fund, um, yes, it's, it's, uh, that's being led by UKG, and it'll be very much, I, I mean, from what I understand, it would be looking at replacement EU funding for some of the programmes. 
Um, I think one of the issues may be that this could end up being looking at looking at replacement funding in the COVID crisis and how it might assist with recovery of the of the economy. There is, um, from what I can remember when I used to do rural development, was that there is a, an EU database which you know ha, it, that there is a published bene list of beneficiaries from EU programs every year. Um, but the, the whole point of the shared prosperity fund was not really to take what the programs were there already in terms of what they did, but do a, a fresh business case and what the need was and where that money would go. Um, so there's probably not a direct read across to the types of projects that were funded under the previous programs to what might be funded under a shared prosperity fund. But we're still pushing for details of what that shared prosperity fund would look like. So overall, it's probably just the amount of money that has gone into the various programs. Um, and if we get that back again through a shared prosperity fund or um, through the cap funding or any other direction, rather than the types of project that it would be would that it would be spent on, because I think they're looking at just taking a fresh look at um, where economically it would be best placed to put the money. So there isn't a list. Well, there will be a list, of, not a list under the Shared Prosperity Fund. We haven't got that level of detail yet. Um, you know, we understand that they are looking at uh, business cases and, and where that money might go. But I would say I would say that might shift a bit in light of the current COVID crisis uh, on how they would use those funds. I, I, I apologise for probing, but it's just in case maybe we're at sixes and sevens of this. I, what I mean by the shared ex um, the prosperity fund is that it, it's going to be the replace the EU funding. I suppose what I'm saying is, do, does the executive, as it sits today, know how much funding comes from the EU into the north and how many jobs? that actually sustains directly, so that if in a year's time there was no EU funding and you have to go to the, uh, the Shared Prosperity Fund, you can say, we need X amount of millions to maintain the employment of X amount of people, and then that means that we're at the status quo, or else we're better off or worse off. Is, there, is that benchmark there in terms of yeah. the amount of money and the amount of jobs? Yes, I mean, one of the things from EU programs would be there is a, a very comprehensive monitoring of program around those, and they would collect information on jobs created. They used to collect jobs sustained, but I'm not sure if they, they still do that, because it's very hard to actually count a job uh, sustained. But certainly there is inf information. Um, I would have been aware on the real development side there would have been that. So I think it, it would be a request that we could coordinate through the Department of Finance. The amount of funds is, is, is easy to get in terms of how much we get in EU receipts, um, and we could certainly look at some of those key indicators um, that come out of each of those programmes. Okay. Okay. Would it be possible, just if, if that was possible, to get that? Just even headline, X amount of millions, X amount of jobs, and, and I'm sure, give or take, a bit, it could be an estimation, but just to give us the ballpark figure of what we're looking at, at A, losing, and B, needing to replace. Yeah, we can certainly request to see how available that information is. Okay, that's great. Thank you, and thanks for clarifying that. I appreciate it. It's, it's not always easy when we're not face-to-face -to, -face to explain these matters. So, um, folks, that, that probably took about a half an hour longer than we would have wanted it necessarily to be, but given that we haven't had the opportunity to have the conversation with any of the executive ministers or yourselves uh, really from probably the end of January or, or early weeks of February, I think it was important to allow us to have that, um, that conversation. And I also appreciate that it is a, such a wide area that, that it's difficult for you to prepare exactly what it is that you're going to get asked. So I, I understand that it can be uh, a difficult a presentation to have to come in and give, but I certainly appreciate your attendance via telephone at this today. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you, thank you, Chair. Thank you, and uh... sorry, Chair. Oh yes, Pat, go ahead. Sorry, Chair. Just before the, the officials go, mm -hmm. um, would it be possible just to uh, ask another question? Yes, of course, Chair. Go on just, ahead. Just, just, just around the whole issue of democratic consent, mm -hmm. um, uh, and, and paragraph. 16, and uh, the briefing paper says it's a, it's a British matter and says the Assembly should write to the NIO. And does this mean that the executive isn't engaging with the matter? Um, I don't think it's seen as 
an immediate issue in that the the question would not arise for uh, a number of years, and uh, the, there's a need. There would be a need. It's not yet translated into UK legislation. Uh, that's another thing that they committed to do was to, to make specific provision for the part for the make specific provisions for how the consent thing would operate uh, in UK legislation. So that, that's something to come. I, I, I do need to break off. Something has come up here. I, I'm, I'm very sorry I have to go, but, but I think that that's um, it, it's an issue. Certainly, I'm happy to, to reflect back the committee's questions back to ministers about this. But if it's okay, Chair, I, I, I need to break off. If, I'm, I'm very sorry. Can you come back to us on that? We will indeed, yes. Yes, we can. Yes. Okay. Thank okay. you, folks. We appreciate your time today. That's, that's great. Thank you very much. And, folks, we'll just take one minute just to allow people to disengage in phones. And Thank you. We'll move on Bye -bye. in just a minute. Thank you. Okay. We're all gone now. I've got one. Yes. Yeah. Just going to ask by name, just for people on the phone then. Pat, you're still there. Oh, Trevor? Yes, Joe, I'm still here. Pat, yeah, Trevor, are you there? Okay, and Emma is listening in, we know. Uh, bye. Sure, just could, could I just make a technical point here? Yes, sure. That, uh, usually we keep our lines muted. Yes, yes. When, when we need to come in, we unmute. There, there's a, about a two or three second time lag mm. for that to happen. Okay. Yeah, that's so, okay. Yeah. I, 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 know, I know from the health committee doing the same that it, by the time you hear your name and then you get to the phone to, to press the mute button, it, it, it can take a second or yes. two. Okay. Right. Well, look, folks, if we're, uh, the, 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 the guests have departed from the line there, so. Um, uh, we maybe just in in following up from that briefing, I I think um, I think it's critically important that we need to increase our our engagement uh, in the short term with the executive office uh, and specifically with the executive office ministers, uh, given that these negotiations are are going to continue and um, that that there is such a short period of time uh, and that we may need to uh, continue to investigate this. Um, there was reference to the fact that the junior ministers had attended uh, the joint committee on the 30th of March. So maybe with members support, should we invite the junior ministers to come up that we might discuss with them what took place at that uh, joint committee to find out exactly what the flavour of the discussions there were? Would that be agreeable? Good. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, also then, just that the, um, the terms of reference for the Executive Brexit subcommittee no longer exists stated that this committee would scrutinise the work of the subcommittee. Um, however, as we know, it is for the Assembly to decide how that scrutiny is carried out. Now, um, the Committee of the Executive Office in September 2016 considered an options paper for Assembly scrutiny of EU issues, uh, including the potential establishment of an Assembly committee to scrutinise the issue of the EU exit. So the committee agreed that the chairperson's liaison group had a key role in identifying the preferred committee mechanism for the coordination of the assembly response to Brexit. So the discussion with the liaison group did not take place of, and then the collapse of the assembly then followed on from that. So um, given the range and scope of issues related to EU exit, could I ask for members' views on whether um, this committee should continue to scrutinise the EU uh, exit or whether making a recommendation to the chairperson's liaison group that a, a specific committee uh, dealing um, exclusively with the Brexit issue uh, be considered. Um, I'm in members' hands as to, uh, but I'm just conscious that today just a briefing from an official has has gone on for an hour and forty minutes, and we we need to bring ministers, junior ministers, probably next week, and and if this is each week. Then the rest of our work is going to stack up. So, I, I think, Chair, it's too broad for this committee. I mean, speaking personally, I don't think I would have the capacity, for example, to scrutinise the DERA implications. 
in sufficient detail, and it wouldn't necessarily be in tune with the DERA committee mm -hmm. and what they're doing. So I think we have a, a lead role, potentially, a coordinating role, potentially, but I don't think we should be trying to take the whole load on, on the shoulders of this committee. And if I may just add on the other thing, bringing the junior ministers up, absolutely. But Andrew said he was attending the specials committee tomorrow. Mm -hmm. uh, I would like us to get the written brief that he gives to the ministers, yeah. ASAP. Yeah. And we asked, we did ask for that, so told him to, to get that to us before next week as well. We did, and he did agree to, to before next week. Any other views in the room? I mean, I think it's, it's something we would like to, to discuss as a party. Um, I concur with the, the scope of this, the scale of it, the breadth of it, and the depth of it is, is so broad and it's, it's touching on every aspect uh, of life here. It's like peeling an onion. Every time you get the one layer, there's another layer, and every layer would make you cry. Um, so um, I do think when you, when you put this in the context of all of the other work that the committee is doing, and um, particularly even in this climate, then this is the climate where the scrutiny needs to take place and the work needs done. Um, uh, we, we need to be able to make sure that our due diligence, if we're, we're doing it properly. Um, so there may the, the rationale of having a dedicated um, committee on, on this particular issue um, may come to the fore. Um, but I would like, uh, because just I'm, I'm here on my own sure. and obviously you can't get a chance to confer, um, it should be something that maybe we should come back on as a committee, maybe to have that wider discussion so we all get a chance to to fire it across our own parties. In terms of expediency, would you take the point that if it goes to the chairperson's liaison group that there would be there there are pro rata an equal number of Sinn Féin representatives in that forum as there would be in this mm -hmm. forum that maybe if we sent them because I'm conscious I think the chairperson's liaison group which only meets once a month is meeting next Tuesday okay. uh, that maybe yeah, it, would, yeah, would, yeah, it, just, yeah, yeah, it may that, take it away from our well that allows us all to have a conversation yeah. in terms yeah. of our own parties and yeah. to give the representative to go in there uh, with a few well I, I can't take it back to my party <laughs> so uh, <laughs> I would concur with what Mike sure. um, brought in what you said yourself chair Okay. And the clerk, just to give and us just an update. Just to point out, when we're going to CLG, we're not going to be making a specific recommendation. Ooh. It's asking CLG to consider what the preferred committee mechanism yeah. is. So yeah. there's no position yeah. as such. Yeah. 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 They, they very well. The CLG may very well say no use to it. <laughs> and it comes back, good. but um, we'll. In the, one of the first mandates, I don't know, like if you were at the first mandate that I was on, but. I know this committee had a lengthy discussion about there needing to be a new dedicated standalone mm -hmm. committee here yeah. outside of itself and, and it never actually got the required support mm -hmm. but there were still quite a substantive number of members who always felt that there needed to be a standalone dedicated EU committee. Okay. I think again, during the run up to Brexit, I think the committee felt even for the period of time mm -hmm. yeah. you needed something. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Dedicated. Well, look, I'm taking everybody's agreement then, yeah. um, mm -hmm. and, and I'll give a second or two for Pat to come in if he wants to say anything to the contrary. But I think people are generally saying that we're happy enough to pass that on for their the guidance of the CLG then. Yeah. Okay, then we can move on to later uh, conversations as we move on to item five, which is the mm -hmm. budget 2020 uh, <laughs> 21. Um, following last week's evidence session, um, the clerk has produced a draft committee response for consideration. The draft covers the discussions that took place uh, after the presentation last week and the issues that were raised during that evidence session. So an updated research paper is at page 21 of the tabled papers today, uh, and it includes the completed templates for all of the other departments and includes correspondence from the Minister of Finance on the COVID-19 and the increased spends for some other departments. Um, if you check on page 51 of the meeting papers, there is a copy of the draft response. Now, the draft co uh, doesn't cover conclusions. Um, it's a paper with suggested conclusions. Uh, it was circulated yesterday for members' consideration, and a, mem a copy of that is available at page 20 of the table uh, pack. So effectively, we had our conversations and discussions last week. Uh, the clerk has prepared a paper, which is not a final paper, it's a paper for discussion today. And maybe if I could pass over to the clerk just to give us details of what is in that paper, and then we can have a discussion if we need after that. So, Okay, the read. response at uh, page 51 of the uh, meeting pack just sets out basically how we went about our scrutiny. 
um, the issues we considered last week, either in written or oral format, and the um, concerns, issues that were raised, or clarification that was sought. Um, and as the chair has just said, the conclusion hasn't been included in that paper. It's for consideration today. But yesterday, um, there were possible conclusions sent out, and really, I just drew those from the discussions that took place. Um, there's one that I want to point out, uh, the third bullet point down, uh, stressing that the funding for HIA scheme should be met centrally from the block grant. Um, it probably would be clearer if um, there was something inserted in there over the lifetime of this scheme because the budget is only dealing with this one year, but I'm open to uh, the committee, to members to tell me what, what they okay. agree or what they don't agree with or what they want amended or... So, and just maybe by, before going in, just as I'm sure all you will know, as I'm the, 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 the junior member in the room in terms of attendance, that this, this will, well, our conversation here will feed into what I'll be feeding in on behalf of the committee to uh, the budget debate, which is taking place um, on Tuesday week. So I'll pass over to the vice chair. Okay, well, well, first of all, thanks to Mary for giving the draft. On the point you raise, yeah, mm -hmm. uh, but are we all content that it's, it's coming out of our block grant over the full period. As opposed to, was there a, if it doesn't come out of the block grant, where else is it going to come from? It doesn't come from anywhere. <laughs> well, well, yeah. Yeah. So, so, I think, yeah. Yeah. so we had an uplift this year of 72.4%, mainly because the 37.5 million uh, was added. There's 56 million for the victims' payments. Mm -hmm. And that money doesn't exist. No. But it's part of this. So that your first bullet point. Yeah. You say, acknowledge and support the uplift of over 72.4% from last year, mm. primarily due to the inclusion of 37.5 million for historical institutes and abuse payments in 2021. <coughs> that money exists and there's no political disagreement at the executive table about making that money available out of the block grant, resource Dell, ring fenced, gets the abuse payments underway. Yeah. And it will continue over a period of years. We're all agreed. But on the so-called victim's pension, which is now the disab permanent disablement payment, yep. there is ring fence Dell of 56.3 million, which is part of that 72.4% uplift. But there is no political agreement no. because the Minister of Finance wants it to come the Treasury. Is the, but the 72, that, that's the... Um the fifty odd fifty odd million was the the pressure that it has been identified, whereas this is what has been allocated. So you're saying that the victims' payments have not been allocated? For for this year to get this scheme going? The, the HIA ones? No, no, the, the, the yeah. No, the scheme the isn't going to progress in this financial year. So the, it's it's there. Provision has been made in Amy for Funding, but it's ring, it's ring fenced down, according to last week's paper. That so. was the pressure that was identified by yeah. the department. But if it's not happening, why is it? It's not a pressure. Would my understanding be that an identified pressure is saying that we may have to pay this out, but it hasn't been confirmed? So they're identifying it as something that they may have to. But because they don't know where it's coming from, they don't know is it coming from the block grant or is it coming from London that it's in the same it's on the same page, the same columns as the institutional abuse. Okay. Yeah, so that's what they had identified. They would have submitted that return. Um but then in terms of the allocation, um the uplift because our budget the our TU budget is quite small. Um, the 37.5 million for the historical institutional boost. Yeah, I think I'm understanding where you're coming from, Mike, that if, if the column includes what you're actually going to have to pay out, but somehow or another it's also including figures that you might have to or might have mm -hmm. to, it's that ambiguity as between, well, is it there or is it not there? Will it be paid out? Will it not be paid out? That there's a, that, that we would need some form of clarity on that and maybe for that maybe on that specific issue we might ask the budget people maybe just to come in for that item and just to have that conversation next week but well, we, 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 we last week this the, the um 
debates on Tuesday. We need to get this response to... Next Tuesday or the Tuesday? Yeah, the fifth. Oh, next week. That's yeah. Fifth. But, I mean, I can contact the department just for, for clarity on that, and we can agree it okay. by um, correspondence, mm -hmm. if that's... I mean, we've, we've, we've two groups of vulnerable people mm. who are looking to the executive to do the right thing. Oh. It looks in terms of the historical abuse group oh. that we are doing the right thing and that we have allocated a reasonable sum of money sure. to start the ball rolling. No, no issue. But with the second group, who are they permanently disabled from the troubles? Mm -hmm. There is no money, there's no agreement, there's no scheme. I mean, that was Mark Brown's point was... He didn't want to address the fact there was no money. He just said, well, there isn't a scheme in place yet. Yeah. Which is, which is true. But even if there was a scheme in place, there is no political agreement at this moment about who funds it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That, that's your understanding, Martina. And my understanding in relation to the victims um, of the conflict, which goes back to, I remember Niels Musniak. Uh, the Human Rights Commissioner who came here and he had he was quite clear of the role of the British government's responsibility both by way of inquiries and payments that it was within it was their responsibility under the European Convention of Human Rights they were the competence that f fell within their competency um, but that's I mean, not an executive an agreed executive position I'm only just as relating as to what, what mm -hmm. Niels Musniak's statement right. was quite mm -hmm. clear. Well, we, when the committee considered the, the supplementary, spring supplementary estimates in the Fulton account, it was agreed at that stage, I don't know whether you were there or not, but that um, Westminster designed this scheme, Westminster put it into law, therefore Westminster should mm -hmm. foot the bill. Yeah, but the NIO so has, that, has not said fair that, enough. Yeah. But is that still the committee view? Yeah, we'll see you see, my, my, my only issue in this is that there's ambiguity about, regardless of the scheme, there's ambiguity about who's going to pay for it. Yes. But we received last week just a letter from a mini uh, the, the minister from, from, from London that was saying it, th that they're still consulting with the parties. and still So to me, it's like the decision hasn't been taken. But what we would need to get, I suppose, an assurance, what we're looking for is that in the absence of determining who it is that's going to pay, that the scheme's going to happen, but just if it's got to be paid either by the block grant or by the, 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 by the Treasury, the issue is, I suppose, maybe from any negotiating, you don't say, well, we're going to do it, and then, cause then the Treasury will just say, no, <laughs> you know, we're not paying for it, and then you've committed to it happening. But I think there, there, would we need to know if there are conversations going on between the Executive well, and the I Treasury? I we learned that lesson uh, only recently with a new decade, new approach. <laughs> mm. And, you know, everyone was promised um, that the, all these schemes were going to be paid for yeah. and at all... You know, and and the British government had promised the every um um every every party that if there was agreement on this, they would come back, they would come forward with the financial, um you know the financial ask to make sure that these could all be implemented. We had everyone shouting about the assembly needed to get back up and round again on the back of this promise, and then once the the parties actually assessed it on the politics of it, if there was enough in it for each of the parties to go forward, of course the British government don't is what it always has done. Mm -hmm. And uh, and once we had we negotiated, mm -hmm. they they started to negotiate backwards. So we didn't get the funding. For a new decade, new approach, and then you have people saying, "Oh, well, why did you just go in without the funding?" So you know, the executive and and the the parties were in a no-win situation with regards to the British government. This no new decade, new approach, where, where there were issues in it that the British government brought forward. As Mike had said earlier, not all of the parties agreed to every aspect of it. We certainly didn't, but we agreed that there was enough in it to take it forward. But they did say they would fund it, mm -hmm. and they haven't. Mm -hmm. So let's not make that mistake with this on this yeah. one. Yeah. And mm -hmm. I mean, my my understanding, even even the Joint First Minister Arlene Foster has said that that, uh, that the British government should should pay for mm -hmm. this. Scheme. Do you want then to to the conclusion to make it more general? You know, you noted that the what the Minister for Finances says that it should be from Treasury, and then. I, th I think we just want to note a, a separate bullet point that notes that there is ambiguity or confusion. Yeah. There's no clarity. 
Okay. I'd like a budget to initiate the Victims Permanent Disability right. Payment Scheme. A budget to initiate and, in and the 2021 20, year. And, yeah, and, and, and if during my contribution this week. Who will, whether it will yeah. be funded by the Northern Ireland Executive out of the block grant or whether it will be funded by Treasury. Um, no resolution. I, I make specific reference to that in the remarks next week to ask the Minister for the and clarification to allow that to be. And the committee debated it. Yeah. They decided it as it had been passed by London. Mm -hmm. It was London's and responsibility to. There was that last week. There was there was full committee. I know we don't have representatives today from the DUP, but they were supportive of that last week. So, okay. Chair, maybe when you're speaking next week, if you could perhaps make the point of whilst. I think it was the collective view of this committee that the historical institution abuse, we would have liked that to be higher mm -hmm. um, in line with what was being even recommended to us, but then that might have been having to open up new legislation yeah. and therefore we accepted uh, what was mm -hmm. presented to us because mm -hmm. we needed the victims, yeah, we start. needed this taken forward. So you might want to actually reference okay. that and others should do so as well so that we're sending the signal to the victims that mm -hmm. uh, we were aware that the payment was not uh, as high as what we'd have liked it to be. Chair, just to make it unanimous, really, uh, the Westminster government has form in this area, and uh, we, we need to uh, tie this down accurately. And you should certainly make that point when you're speaking next week. Okay. Uh, we don't we don't actually know the amount involved anyway. So yeah. mm -hmm. how can how can we, as a regionalised parliament here, commit to something we don't know how much is involved? Mm -hmm. I think it needs to tie it down. Pat, I know you're on uh, telephone there. Is there anything else that you would like to add to that? Or are you happy with where we are with what remarks we've made? No, I, I'm happy enough with the contribution that Martina has made there. Colin, thanks. Okay, good. Yeah, back to the clerk. Just to double check, you're content with the um, conclusions, but, but as for most of them as they stand, in terms of the HIA, um, you want to add in the bit about the raising the cap and how we got the response, the letter that said, you know, in current times, whatever it was, and also an extra bullet point to highlight that there's no clarity about a budget um, to initiate the scheme in the 2021 um, time frame and no clarity on how it's going to be funded. So, okay. And, and it's our unanimous will to see the scheme initiated. Yeah. In in this current financial year. And the British government should fund it. Okay. Yep. Okay, thank you. That's always easier when we're all agreeing. So that's that's good for that. Um, okay, so then we can move on to item six, the forward work plan. Um, it starts on page sixty. Uh, we have a few scheduled um, uh, inputs over the next few weeks. The Victims and Survivors Service have confirmed that the um, Chief Executive will join us next week to give us an update on that. Um, the Equality Commission is scheduled to brief us on the week after that. And also within the uh, Forward Work Plan, there are a number of other inputs that are still uh, being scheduled, but we don't want to go too far in advance in terms of circumstance. So, um, but next week we'll have some more of the, the updates f for beyond that. Are members happy to note? Yep. Yep. Okay, item seven, correspondence. There are seven items for correspondence on page 64 to 91. And then there are some within the tabled papers, pages 21 to 28. If I could draw members' attention to a number of items. Um, so items 7.2, 7.3 and 7.4 on the main meeting pack and 7.6 and 7.7 um, on the tabled pack. Uh, we have received a number of correspondence from a number of individuals regarding the historical institutional abuse. The committee has also been copied into a letter from the Savia Lobby Group to the Department requesting a meeting to discuss issues relating to the delivery of services and support to victims of and survivors of historical institutional abuse. I mean, I think we all uh, within the committee are um, truly sympathetic to the, the issues that have been raised here. We need to act uh, on behalf of um, those that have been corresponding to us. Um, and I suppose what, what I sense from the letters is that they're inputting into an official level within the executive office and that they maybe are not getting the responses as, as quick or with the speed or um, depth that they would like. I think we would all agree that that's not uh, nothing that we would like to see. And what I'm suggesting here is that 
whenever we've got issues with departments, that we go right to the top and that we correspond to the First and Deputy First Minister and ask that the department addresses the issues that are raised within the correspondence and do so in a timely manner so that we can uh, give that assurance to the people that have come to us that we are requesting of the, the top ministers that there is a, res, uh, a response in this matter. Would members be in agreement with that? Sure, could I comment on that? Yes, certainly, Pat. Go ahead. Sure, I would, I would agree with what you're saying there. No difficulty with that. But there, there's also another issue in the letters, and that uh, relates to the uh, conflict of interest or perceived conflict of interest of the interim advocate for victims of historical abuse. And I wouldn't in any way want to impugn the integrity of Brenton McAllister, uh, not by any stretch of the imagination. But many of the victims do have a view that there is a conflict of interest given his uh, role or his future role uh, within the Catholic Church. And, and that's clearly a matter for himself. Uh, and I have no criticism of him at all in any regard. But uh, it, it's not just where there's a clear conflict of interest that this arises. It's also if there is a perceived conflict of interest that perhaps uh, it's a matter that needs to be addressed. I'm not sure how we do that as a committee, but certainly I would want to put it on the record that it is uh, uh, an issue that's further complicating uh, the matter around the whole issue of historical institutional abuse. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah, I, I, I understand exactly what you're saying there, Pat, and I suppose, um, having given thought myself to this, that, that I think that the, the remarks within the, the, the correspondence are legitimate for people to make, that, that anybody can make any remark, of course, it's the, not getting the response. I think the concern is that the people are contacting into the department and they're not hearing back from them. So I think if we have a role as a committee, it's about contacting the very top of that department and saying, these people are asking questions. Can you please answer them? They're, they're just asking questions. Um, and, and you know, there's never any uh, harm in communicating with people. Uh, and certainly from this perspective, I think the, that, you know, we, we certainly are, can ask the ministers to, to make sure that their officials respond. Um, I... Chair, yeah, Chair, just in terms of what you're saying, Pat, um, what if, in addition to what the Chair is suggesting, writing to the, the politicians, we also wrote to the head of the civil service, specifically asking, is he aware? When did he become aware? And does he agree that it is either A, a conflict of interest, or B, a perceived conflict of interest, because he would have had a role in the appointment yeah. of the interim advocate. Okay. Yes, I would agree with that, and uh, there is some suggestion perhaps that uh, the appointment was made before the, the head of the civil service was aware of the, the role that the, the interim advocate might have in the Catholic Church. Mm -hmm. So would Chair, yeah. that, that would be my suggestion. Yeah. We cover that specific separately. Yeah. Uh, I, I think that probably all of us are aware too that um, notwithstanding the correspondence that we have received, and we take all of that serious uh, in terms of how people are feeling, of course. whether it's perceived or real, um, it, need, it needs to be dealt with. But there's also um, a lot of other people, a lot of other organisations who are quite supportive um, of the of the interim advocate and we don't want to be given the impression that there is widespread concern but I think any individual has the right to reply, the right to know, the right to defend if, if someone is making um, an, an assessment that they're not doing their job effectively as they see it. So we, we probably, we just need to be careful of, of where we stand both legally and um, ensuring that someone's con people's concerns are aired, response responded to and aired, and I don't know as part of the work program, do we have an opportunity to call all of the different groups, um, the HIA groups, because there are quite a number of them uh, together, as opposed to one group and another over another or whatever, because 
they're all victims and uh, they all should be heard equally. It's it certainly probably pre um, Martina, your time joining the committee, that was certainly an intention, yeah. but I think circumstance and, and not being yeah. now I think we are we are picking a pace up of sort of saying that we are able to mm -hmm. to maybe start doing some work where even maybe two to three weeks ago we were sticking just to yeah. law and money mm -hmm. and we're, but we're branching out. So that's certainly something that we could maybe based on the response that we get yeah. Mm -hmm. um, back that could inform <laughs> the speed of which we maybe need to bring mm -hmm. groups in. Trevor, are you um, yeah, I'm not quite up to speed to this, but it has. So we'll just ask a couple of questions. Has, has Brendan McAllister a formal role within the Roman Catholic Church? That's the question one. And question two would be, has he ever said anything? I, I, I'm a bit on 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 comfortable answering those questions, but maybe what we could do is direct you to the. I don't, I'll take advice. I, I don't know whether I can, I'm, I'm in a place to answer those questions, and it's not for me to speak for anybody. No, it, you know, it's, it's really. Okay, but I'm just. I can still put it out there. Yeah, yeah. Has he? Well, put it another way, has he sort of publicly said something that would cause this this sort of concern? I, I, I've read the letter now. I can see that this particular victim has major concerns about the way that she, or she has been treated by the person we're talking about. Chair, can I suggest we come back to this in closed session at the end? Uh, and, uh, well, certainly, yeah. Or, or if there's a series of questions that the member thinks there's, we can maybe find the right people for you to ask those questions of. I just, I, I'm uncomfortable about talking about people when they're not in a room and, and, and answering for them, but I understand exactly the questions that you're asking and the reasons for asking them, but it's just I'm not sure if there's anybody in the room qualified to answer them. So, the, the, you know, but we can... Talk informally. Yeah. Them. If you're happy enough to... We can go into closed session now. Um, I, I'm, I'm happy with if the committee wishes to, but I al always generally prefer us not to go into closed session in the sense that it prefers to be open and transparent. But maybe if there was some research that you could do before next week with people, and if you felt there were questions that needed to be formally asked, we could. Okay. Okay. Um, okay. So we're going to. Uh, there's agreement there for us to write to the first and deputy first minister, just given the the remarks. We're not suggesting the remarks are right yeah. or wrong or yeah. different. We're just saying that the questions have been asked of the civil service there uh, and the officials, and therefore we're asking that those are yeah. clarified. J just to be clear, it's to write to the um, first and Deputy First Minister asking um, that they respond directly to the organisations of the victims and that we are copied into the response. And also we write to Hawks yeah. um, to ask, um, is he aware, when did he become aware of the conflict or perceived yeah. Yeah. conflict? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And and also our view is you know, we're not casting dispersions one way or another in anyone's mm -hmm. character here. We're not taking where this has just been brought to our attention and we're processing this mm -hmm. as we are expecting to process. Mm -hmm. But but other than that we're also aware of the high regard that is held by many of the other groups. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then which is a matter of public record, just in conclusion. Is that the process for the replacement is 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 was promised by June? Although I think it's, it's maybe one month or yeah, we could ask for an update yeah. on that to find out where that is. Okay. But that will um, that will put in place a new uh, advocate, a new commissioner, which which hopefully will allow for a fresh round of of relations. But that should be very soon within. I mean, we might be under double digits of weeks, but within a period of, of weeks that that should be taking place. Can I just make it clear? I'm, I'm not casting this person no, no. on either no. mm, on any of the victims or the other no. advocate. No way. No. I just think we need a bit more information. OK. Um, are there any other items in the correspondence that people would wish to... I, uh, OK. Then we can move to item eight for chairman's business. If you indulge me just for two minutes, and I'm sure you will agree with this, I just wanted to say that maybe on a, I think that all opportunities should be taken at the current time to make these remarks regarding coronavirus. And um, you know, I think that we have seen lower levels of hospital admissions and maybe lower than anticipated um, death rates. But just to keep reiterating that that is because people have been socially distancing, that they have been cocooning, uh, they've been isolating themselves, and generally our community has been so good at staying at home. But I think just about everybody is acknowledging that recently uh, 
it's we're saying people are bored they're stuck at home they want to get outside they want to participate in many elements of life and they're not able to and that is deeply frustrating and exceptionally difficult i can only imagine what it's like if you've a house full of uh, children uh, and they're not able to get out and play and able to participate in normal life um, but you know we have to understand that if we do go outside of the home then we are increasing the chances of spreading this disease and if we think of every Thursday night all the people that go out and clap and support for the National Health Service that is absolutely wonderful but the greatest thing that we can do for our health service is then to go back into our homes and close the doors and where we can stay within the house. Um, the rates are going down. We're hearing methods, messages such as being at the peak uh, about the, the level flattening out. And the thing that always strikes me for that is that that means we're halfway. We've done what we've done over the last five six weeks to get us to this point we just have to accept that that means that there's going to be another three four five weeks ahead where we do need to maintain just as many of the rules about socially distancing and staying inside that is the greatest thing that we can do for our healthcare workers is preventing the spread of the virus and certainly i just wanted to take this opportunity as chair to encourage people to please please to stay at home to keep socially distancing when you must go out and to continue to wash hands because that's what's going to save lives so i just wanted to take that chance under chair remarks would members like to come in just martina chair, just uh, i would like to um, add to what you're saying because i absolutely concur people have been remarkable um, they deserve a round of applause too because they have been the lion's share. The vast majority of people have complied with the restrictions, restrictions that we're all uncomfortable with, but they're necessary at this moment in time. But just to share information on my way here this morning, and um, for instance last week as well, I have noticed an increase in traffic yeah. on the road um, at the times when I'm coming here. And you can see that it's starting to build up a little bit. So. It is about getting that message out that we cannot afford um, any complacency. We know, looking and watching other countries, where that we're ahead of Ireland and elsewhere, that once they started to relax um, the measures, that a second wave started to, to creep in. Of course, people do need to have information as to how this is all going to unfold, but it is about trying to encourage people to, that you cannot avoid a virus when you don't know where it is. Right. And this virus is as dangerous uh, today as it was six weeks ago. I would just concur and say maintaining lockdown is, is obviously increasingly difficult, but it's essential. Yeah. Because if we relax and we get hit by a second wave, the second lockdown will be much harder to endure, much harder to police, and much less likely to save lives on the scale the first this current lockdown is doing. Chair, sure, I think I agree with what you say, but and I noticed this increase in traffic and people on the wave as burned have opened the parks in the last few days and they're they're pretty crowded, you know, because people are so relieved. I think that the pressure is building for easement and this is you rightly say the time when we have to hold the line. And I would put it on record, I think Robin Swan has done a terrific job so far. In terms of all this, but uh, at the same time, I do notice when 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 I look at, uh, for instance, our park of Wallace Park, um, people a lot more people in there, <clears throat> but they are maintaining discipline. They're staying separate. A lot of them are wearing masks. They're keeping social distance, and uh, so there's been a lesson learned by the last few weeks. So slight easement might not it might relieve that pressure a wee bit and let people think they're getting somewhere but we still have to keep the pressure on yeah okay pat do you want to add to that or you uh no there's nothing uh more that i can add i just want to agree with practically everything that has been said there Okay, I think it's, it's an important message for us to send out as a, an executive office committee that had some responsibility for those uh, rules that were, were being implemented as well. Um, item 9, any other business? Nope. Okay, so then the date, item 10, the date, time and place of the next meeting will be next Wednesday at 2 o'clock in this room. So thank you very much indeed. Very and we'll see you then. Okay. Thank you. Thank this you. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30.
This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly.